There we go. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Hello, everybody. It's, um, it's my pleasure to be with you today. And uh, I'm going to be, I'm John Cogley. I'm the owner of Daniel Smith. I've been with Daniel Smith for just a tad under 35 years. So um, seems like yesterday, uh, the years go really, really quick. Um, and it's, it's always been a lot of fun working here and uh, being part of this organization. And it's really the artists that we um, sell to and have dialogue with that make it the most fun. Uh, making things is fun. Human interaction is actually way more fun. So what I'm going to be going over today, I'm, I'm going to go over how, how we make watercolor, the differences of the different watercolors we have, how to read a watercolor chart, which I think is probably the most um, important thing for you as an artist to be able to understand. It gives you huge amounts of power um, over color. And then uh, I'll go over the gouache. We have 22 colors out so far with gouache. We'll bring another 22 out by this November. So I'll go over kind of what's in process with that um, at the end of the hour or, or uh, maybe um, hour 15 minutes. I'm going to ask Giovanni, who is our brand ambassador. Um, Giovanni Gentile is a wonderful artist. He'll also be um, coming in and out. I'll just watch this. He'll be coming in and out, showing different colors, etc., cetera, um, and then doing a presentation at the end. So um, anything that has to do with painting, we're going to do at the end. So please have that um, ready for Giovanni to be able to demonstrate, et cetera. Okay. So with that, I'm going to flip my camera. I love questions. Um, if I can't answer them, I love them better. So with that, I'm going to flip the camera around and we're going to go ahead and start. beautiful train yard in front of me so there's always motion of railroad trains um, okay. so we're going to start with how paint is going to be you have this um, available to you so if you want to take it out uh, that'd be great. If not, you can watch with me here on screen. So this is the kind of the story about how we make paint. And for us as a manufacturer, the most important part, the most important part for anybody that has a retail store, um, has anything to do with customers, is this right here. And for us, that's the artist. Um, this is the most important part to us. We're very good about making paint. There's no limit to what we can make, but it has to be for an advantage for the artist. So this is always our main focus. And once we hear dialogue, hear input about what might be needed, what would make life easier, um, et cetera, then we go through the process of making paint. Here is my mineralogist. This is Bruce Wood. I send Bruce all over the world to search for minerals, which I'll be showing you in a moment. And also we look at uh, what's created in the laboratory, which are synthetics. And I'll be going over what a natural pigment is versus what a synthetic pigment is. Once we have it, we go through the processing of the um, minerals. We go through a series of steps, which I'm going to show you, to make it into pigment. And then from pigment, we go through a process of making it paint for the artist. Okay. So this is me, John, started here um, in uh, God, 1988, a long time ago for me. Um, the two places that we get pigment, and making paint is always having the best pigment. It's pretty much like anything. If you want to be and sell to professional artists, you want to make sure that you have the best possible pigment. Um, from the earth, for example, this is hematite, which I'll be showing you later. This is crystal hematite. This comes from the USA, comes from Idaho. You can see the crystalline form. We get that from the earth and we process that. I'm gonna show you how we process it to actually develop the Primatech paints, Primatech. There's also from the laboratory and anything can be made in the laboratory. Um, the laboratory is where you wanna to go to make things that are absolutely perfect. So because many of our products are made for the car industry, for example, when acridones, um, 
perylenes, pyrroles. These are all synthetic. They're all made in the laboratory. Um, they're absolutely perfect. They're all the same size. They're all the same shape. They're all the same weight. And therefore, you don't get granulation on many of these. I'll show you where you do, but on the majority, you don't. Um, the neat thing about them, they're very light fast. They're very colorful. The light fastness is a one, which means they're 100 plus years as we test them. Um, they're just phenomenal pigments that make phenomenal paint. Okay. So two places we get pigments, earth and the laboratory. Um, the neat thing that I always love is that um, I just came back from Egypt and I can see pyramids, um, et cetera, that were made thousands of years ago. Artwork that was made 4,000 years ago by artists. The, some of the main people, the pharaohs, et cetera, we know some of their names, but we don't know pretty much anybody else's names. But artwork lives on. It's the artwork that when you go to Egypt that you really see and tells the story of a whole culture. And that's really what artwork is about, always has been about. It tells about um, the society and what the artists saw in front of them. So whether it's from France or it's from Australia or Africa, um, uh, Mesoamerica, it's always about the feeling of the artist and what they saw through their eyes. And it's lived, you know, 10,000 years which is pretty phenomenal. This is the process of how we make pigment from minerals. And minerals are not rocks, minerals are minerals. Rocks can be igne igneous, they could be uh, metamorphic, they could be sediment sedimentary. They're different than a mineral. So this right here is lapis. This is lapis, this is lapis. And lapis is a pretty, it's a beautiful mineral that's been used for thousands of years. Egypt, it was used 4,000 years ago. Um, we process lapis into pigment. This is the pigment. This is 80% pure lapis. I'll tell you more about that in a second. So I send Bruce all over to um, talk to miners, etc. cetera. Um, we meet with them in Tucson, Arizona. It's where we take receipt of our minerals. That way it goes through customs. It comes with all the right paperwork, um, et cetera. That's really important to us. Um, we begin the processing of it. We use three mills to do that. We use what's called a jaw mill. And as you can see with this, Kind of, that's much easier so you can see the different crystals. And the thing, when something's a crystal and you put pressure on it, it will cleave along its axis. So what we do is we use the jaw mill and we'll start with a piece maybe this size, size of my hand, or maybe four times this size. And it will squeeze it, just squeeze. And it breaks apart. And what we want to do is break them apart to the size of probably the size of this rhodonite, so this big. And then once we do that, and that's a long process, once we do that, we put it to another mill right here. It's called a hammer mill, and it just hits and hits and hits and hits, and again, keeps on cleaving that crystal more and more. When it leaves the hammer mill, it's probably the size of a grain of rice. We then take that and we put it to a ball mill. And this is just like your dryer. It tumbles and tumbles and tumbles and tumbles and tumbles. It could take 30 days. It could take three months. It's a very long process. And finally, what comes out is product that or pigment that is 40 microns or less. 40 microns, the thickness of this piece of paper is 100 microns. 40 microns is less than half the width of this piece of paper. And that'd be on the big side, but it's, it's almost impossible for you to see. 
So it's a very, very long process. And I'm asked by many of you, because um, in the groups, there's doctors, um, lawyers, there's engineers. And it's usually the engineers that will say, hey, John, you can actually do, instead of taking three months to do that, you can do that pretty quickly by putting it into a, a hydraulic press and just pressing it. And I said, yes, that would make it much, much quicker. However, there'd be no color. It would just, it would be dead. And to give you an example of that and why the process takes so long, if I took table sugar and I brought it out to the sunlight and I moved it around with my hand or in a, in a glass jar, you'd see beautiful reds and blues and greens. And that's because that's still a crystal, right? There's still, it's still beautiful. If I took the same sugar, but now in a powdered form and brought it outside, it'd be deader than the doornail because the crystals have all been destroyed. So the game of making the Primatex is how not to destroy the crystal. And the only way to do that is to cleave it and take time. And in my business and any business, time always costs money because it takes My more goodness. overhead, it takes more everything, the longer it takes. But this is a process that has to take time or you don't have the beauty. The thing that we're gonna see within the Primatex when I show you the drawdowns is these are fantastic granulating colors because they're minerals and they're imperfect. So, let me give you an example of size. So this is an example of size. This right here is ultramarine blue, and this is French ultramarine. So ultramarine. French ultramarine. This is a one part paint to 10 parts distilled water. And then we do a wash, okay, one to 10. This is the same thing, we clean out the brush, we do a one ten solution and we do until we hit the end of the paper. So it shows the variability of this color, how, how, how much you can see and be able to use it. Okay, so same thing, one to 10, one to 10, ultramarine, French ultramarine. These are both, Pigment blue, number 29. They're exactly the same. Not, not kind of the same. They're exactly the same. Some of you use French ultramarine. Some of you use ultramarine. Do you know what makes these two different? So I can't see your answering because, so I'm just going to tell you what makes them different. It's the size of the particle, size of particle. The French ultramarine blue is a slightly bigger particle, and the ultramarine blue is a slightly smaller particle. And so when light comes in and strikes it, the French ultramarine moves toward the red or the warm. And for the, with the ultramarine, when it hits it, it moves toward the green or the cool. So if you've never known why you might like one over the other, is ultramarine is slightly cooler, slightly more green. French ultramarine is slightly warmer, slightly more red. And that's all done by C Lab, which at some point I'd love you to join me and we can explain what that means. Okay, so that's how a color can change just because the size of the particle. If we look at the lapis, so this is the lapis. This is what we do in-house. We manufacture this. This is 80% pure lapis. And this is ultramarine blue. I love this color. It's my favorite color, ultramarine blue. This is $2,000 a kilo. This is $9 a kilo. $9, $2,000. Um, sometimes people come up to me during a presentation and say, you know, I can find uh, ultramarine blue and it's this blue and it's $10. And it's like, there's no way that's impossible. They're, they're using ultramarine blue synthetic. 
which again, it's my favorite color. Uh, if you want to paint like the masters, this is a good way to go. It, it's a very, it's a baby blue, which I'll show you when we look at the Primatex. And this is a very striking dark blue, okay? but it's synthetic. Again, it's, it's the one um, going after a semi-precious metal that when it's polished is absolutely beautiful, makes beautiful jewelry. Um, so it has value there. And also the time it takes to process this down to pigment um, is why this costs so much per pound. If it were 90% pure, this would be about 35 to $40,000 a kilo. Um, it's, so when you look at some of the master's work and you go, wow, that's a beautiful blue robe. It is absolutely breathtaking, and it is real lapis. But back in those days, lapis was the same price as gold. And so it shows you, it shows you that it was done by the church, done by a country, or very, very, very wealthy patrons. And that's how they were showing their, their power and their money is through using that lapis, which is gorgeous until today. Okay. So on this page, I'm going to go over, and there's a, um, on the danielsmith.com site, um, there is a movie on how lapis is made. And if you want to see all the machines in action and how all the different mills work, that will go over in about three minutes and show you all of that. So this is how paint is made. And so it, it's whether it's a Primatec or whether it's a um, synthetic, this process is going to be the same. So what we do is we start with a vessel, and in our facility, we can go from roughly one ounce to 600 gallons. So that's our variation. Um, inside the vessel, we always start with distilled water. People ask me, can I use any water for watercolor? Uh, the answer to that is, of course you can. Um, what, what happens if you do, and that's always your choice, my mother would, um, it's, it's what's in that tap water. My sister lives on a five acre farm. Um, hers is from a well. It's, it's going to have bacteria in it. Not harmful bacteria, but it's certainly going to have bacteria in it. Um, uh, if you get it from the tap, like my house, I have a lot of um, chlorine. So we always use distilled water. It's probably going to give you your best results. However, any any water will do. So after we put the water, the pigment, the gum arabic into one of the vessels, then we're going to go ahead and we're going to start mixing. And this is very um, similar to what you do at home when you're making a cake. You want to get all the material wet, right? You want to so your cake mix is dry, your eggs are wet, your milk is wet. You want it to all be wet. Um, the difference is your egg beater or mixer might be two feet high. Ours are 16 to 20 feet. Um, they're just huge, but this, the principle is still the same. So once we go ahead and we mix it up, what happens is we get what's called an agglomerate. An agglomerate is particles are electrostatic, so they want to join together. They're like little magnets and they want to be with each other. And if we let that happen, then what happens is when light hits it, it bounces all over the place and you get hot spots and cold spots. So then what we have to think of is, okay, how do we make that linear so that when light hits it, it's uniform. So no hot spot, no cold spot. Many of you have, have gone to art museums probably looked at some of the masters and said, I wonder why that spot's a little bit more bright than the ones around it. There's really no reason for that. It was because they only had so much power to, to be able to do the mulling with their hands. And so there were different sizes and they couldn't break them apart. And that's why they got hot spots and cold spots. What we use to get rid of that is we use what's called a dispersion mill. And the dispersion mill has two rolls that move in opposite directions. And what that does, it tears the material apart. It's constantly breaking that agglomerate into its individual particles and then putting gum arabic around them so they don't come back and rejoin with each other. And that's a very long process because that's what's going to make the artist paint vibrant. 
Um, otherwise, you're going to have hot spots and cold spots. And it, it's it's a time, it's it takes time to do this because I ex as I explained with the um, ultramarine blue and the French ultramarine blue, the only difference here is the size of the particle. So if we tear particles too much, we can actually change the U. So it's it's computer controlled. It takes a lot of a lot of practice. Our batch makers have been with us for thirty years. They're just experts and masters at doing this. So that's in essence how paint is made. Lots of time, lots of other steps, but those are the majority steps. Then we fill it and put it into tubes. The tube has a lot of information on the crimp. It has when it was made, etc. Um, this is a nice movie for you to watch, How We Make Paint. It's on the website. It'll show you the whole process of how we make lapis. Might be interesting for some of you. Probably one of the most important things for you as an artist um, is light fastness. And light fastness is how long a color will last when presented to light. And so we test all of ours with this machine right here. It's called a xenon fadeometer. It's about seven feet high, about four feet wide, and about three feet deep. And has a rotating cage inside of it with a two-foot xenon bulb. And in 16 days, we can do 100 plus years of light. So even though the manufacturer tests the pigment, we test all pigment that comes in. Um, we sell to professional artists. Um, you want to know that the material is going to last, so we test it all. This is another machine that we use, which is a photospectrophotometer. And the photospectrophotometer, the way that kind of that works is we use a, um, a drawdown. We take a certain area of it. We present that to the machine. It gives us out a reading. We then put it to the xenon phenometer, 16 days, 18 days, what, whatever it might be. We go back to the same exact spot that we used before. We test it again, and we look at the variance between the before and the after. And that's how we look at light fastness. It's the same way the um, ASTM does it. Okay. The other thing that we use this for, which is important to us, it shows there's no change in it. We're keeping continuity from color to color, not only for light fastness, but we're keeping the color the same from batch to batch to batch. That's really important as a professional artist or an artist that is selling your, um, that where that matters to you, which, which should be all professional artists. Um, if you're in the middle of a painting and you use the next tube, the next tube is going to have the same you, et cetera, as the tube you just finished. So it's it's not an, oh my God moment. I'm out. What do I do now? I'm halfway done my painting. Is that next tube going to be different? And are people going to ask me, why is that red different there versus 10 inches below it? Okay, that's checking for continuity. So I have two chemists. The chemists are constantly checking with their full laboratory for continuity and for other qualities of the paints that we're making. This right here is about granulation. And granulation or reticulation or flocculation is all the same thing. And let me show you examples of it. So this is Munglo, and you can see the granulation. Can you see the granulation, this spec right here? That's granulation. This is shadow violet. This is piemontite, which is a primatech. You can see the heavy granulation. That's natural. And this is cyclorite. Again, granulation, this is natural. These are from natural pigments, which are minerals, which I'll show you in a moment. 
Okay, so natural, and these two are synthetic. So moon glow, and probably there's quite a few that use moon glow. It's a beautiful, beautiful color. Um, it's made of alizarin crimson, um, viridian, and ultramarine blue. And shadow, vi shadow violet is made of pyro orange, viridian, and ultramarine blue. So you can see that granulation. My camera's trying to fight me. I want the light. Every time it sees the light, it wants to shade it to dark. I wish it wouldn't do that, but I don't know how to turn it off. Um, so with Moon Glow, this one, for example, what we see is that the anthroid red is very light and it, it floats to the top, whereas the ultramarine blue is slightly heavier and stays in the middle. And then the viridian, being the heaviest, goes to the bottom. That's what causes the granulation. Differential specific gravity is really the root of granulation. It's a very beautiful uh, effect. Um, it's very interesting. Again, these are synthetic. The moon glow has a very nice red tint to it. The shadow butt has a really nice orange tint to it because the pyro orange and the red because the um, anthroid red. And then we have the Primatex, which I'll talk over more in a moment. So that's, that's granulation. That's the process of granulation. So now, this is to give you relative size. So this right here is a salt crystal. It's a crystal of salt. This right here is the cross section of a human hair. This right here is 40 microns. That's the biggest particle size we would have for our Permatex. They actually go much smaller than that. Um, ultramarine blue is probably two microns right here compared to a human here. See how small it is? And then French ultramarine blue is eight microns, the same size as a red blood cell. So the particles that you're never really seeing the particles, you're seeing the effect of many of the particles. Um, and the neat thing about being a watercolor is you, it's the only medium where you really get to see what the color looks like. Because within oil, I love oil painting, um, it's within linseed. And if you're using acrylic, it's within a polymer. Only with the watercolor are you seeing what the actual pigment looks like on the surface. So it's a, it's a really, really um, awesome medium. Okay, so next what I wanna go over, um, oh, you're really good in time. Next what I wanna go over is, um, I'm asked quite a bit wherever I travel, John, if I know the color, um, the common name of the, um, of the watercolor, is that gonna be the same with everybody? So if it's PV-19, will that be the same for Holbein and Windsor Newton, et cetera? And the answer to that is no, because within any, within any of those, there's variances in shades, et cetera. And we're gonna pick the most expensive because using the most expensive is gonna be the brightest and, and have other characteristics that we want. We're selling to professional watercolors. Um, it's gonna have fantastic light fastness, et cetera. So that's gonna be what we choose. But let me show you just so you can kind of see. So this right here is quinacridone and you may not know, but quinacridone, so quinacridone means five rings. That's what quinacridone means, means five rings. And it's how those rings are presented with their alpha and beta particles that, that show the color. So this one right here, the um, index is PV19, PV19. P is always for pigment. I'm gonna show you this in the color chart. P is just always for pigment. V, violet, and then number 19. Okay. So this is PV19, twin violet. 
This is PV-19, Quinn Rose. And this is PV-19, Quinn Red. So all of them are PV-19. None of them look the same. So just knowing the color index is not going to help you know what the shade looks like. Okay, it's always going to vary. Okay, so we saw here, it was by size. So on the ultramarines, it was by size. And on the quins, we're seeing it by chemistry. Okay. Okay. So before I go on to the color chart, which I think is probably the most important thing for you to understand in the, as an artist, it gives you the power over the watercolor, which I really, really like. Um, do you have any questions? So I think see. everybody is so focused, John, and enjoying your all this wonderful stuff you're sharing that. Okay, never mind. We got some. Um, Scott asked, how do chemists move the alpha and beta particles to make the color look different? So that's done by the pigment manufacturer. And that is a very, very um, prolonged process. I believe it's, uh, to make a quinacridone takes over 25 um, steps. Um, it cost roughly $20 million to make a, um, uh, uh, cost about 20 million to make a quin color. Um, it's a patented, uh, a, it's patented process um, that they won't release. And it's, uh, the chemists that are doing that are like Ford has a huge amount of chemists that just do color. Um, GM has a huge amount of chemists that just do color, Dow Chemical. Uh, they're just, they're phenomenal at what they do and, and they're just playing with uh, molecular change, chains, um, just like the pharmaceutical company does to create new things. They just constantly figure out how they're going to move the chain, what they want, and then they um, just do that in the laboratory. Wow. All right. Um, and Liz asks, what makes the Quinn what it is? So the Quinn, it was just a name that um, was given it to it by, um, I think it was Dow Chemical, um, just came up with it. So they probably saw, so as I go over the color chart, um, I'll try to add it in a different way. Lemon yellow, for example, here is a single pigment, it's PY, pigment yellow number 175. Um, Paraline scarlet is pigment red 149. The rule of thumb is if it's a single pigment, the, the, the creator of that particular color gets to name it. That's why we have quinethalone um, uh, in, in danthrone, for example. Those are from the chemical companies that created it and that's what they wanted to call it. So that's what we call it. Um, I'm sure the people at the, you know, at the, at Dow, whatever, they saw five rings, they probably said, well, quinethalone, quin quinacridone would be an interesting name to call it. That's what we call, they call it, so that's what we call it. So it's kind of like if you have a child, you call your child Nancy, I don't call her um, Mary. You are the creator, that's the name you gave, I follow suit and, and, and use that same name that, that you created. Does that make sense? That's to me. Okay. Thank you, John. Those we have a really couple more. Questions. Do you want me to save these or do you want to? Sure. I'm going to get ready to do that. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, what size batches is the paint made in? So the paint batch can vary. And what I mean by that is there's times that um, uh, we have three or four distributors or 30 or 50 retailers that want a color and we're gonna get low. And so we might make a special batch. Well, we, what we have, we run uh, close to 100% in stock, which means there's times we have, to, if we might have to do an emergency batch of three gallons. We will lose money on every single tube because we can't cover cost. 
Um, but one of the biggest things for us is not to be out of stock. It just says the artist needs that color. We're going to make that color. Um, places like Plaza, they don't want customers coming in and seeing a empty no paint. Um, neither do we. So we will make that. So we can make anything from one gallon to um, 600 gallons. Um, normally, we'll make somewhere in the range of about 10,000 tubes at a time. And I will say from the perspective of Plaza that with the supply chain issues over the past few years, your commitment to that fill rate and not being out of stock um, probably contributed greatly to your, you know, to Daniel Smith being one of the only full racks in the stores. So that is greatly appreciated that you are committed. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, great okay. being in your store. Susan says that if she opens up a tube and there's gum Arabic that first come out comes out, what does this do to? I've had that issue with cerulean blue and also green gold. Yeah, so it, it depends on a couple of things. Um, in the bottom, of, let me fill up a tube. It goes in this way. It's already capped. It's open here, and so we fill it from the from the bottom, right? And so when we crimp it. You can see this is very round, but this is like a little football. It means there's a little ear pocket right here. So when we crimp it, there's a little ear pocket. There's no way to get rid of it. And depending on how light or how heavy the material is, that little ear pocket can move and push the gum arabic, the free gum arabic to the top. It's kind of like going to the beach and you put um, a bucket of sand really quick with water and you wait 30 seconds and water's at the top and you get rid of the water at the top and the stand is still wet. So the pigment will always hold on to the amount of gum arabic at once. You can just dispose of the gum arabic at the top. You do not need to keep it. That's great. Okay. Um, how do you make permanent versions of older colors such as sap green? So let me show you these two. So I think it's going to answer the same question. This is alizarin crimson. And alizarin crimson is a coal tar derivative. Um, it is fugitive. It's only one of two fugitive colors we have. We have one called aqua pink, which I made for the Botanical Society. Here. And alizarin crimson. Alizarin crimson was used by the masters. It's still a fantastic seller. Many of the professors throughout the world want their students to use it. Um, the professors are very knowledgeable. They know that this is a fugitive color, but they want their students to try it to, to paint the same way the masters did. Um, we also offer for professional artists, anybody that wants to use it, a permanent version. The permanent version is um, several different pigments that we mix together to create the same color as the alizarin crimson, but it's in a permanent version. Alizarin crimson will never be permanent by itself because it's a coal tar derivative. When we look at the opera pink, the reason it's so beautiful, it's a fluorescent. Fluorescents are very beautiful. They're always fugitive. Um, so over time, the opera pink will go away, maybe 25 years, could be 30, 40 years, depending on whether you have it behind UV glass, et cetera. Um, however, for ours, it's never going to go to white because underneath the opera pink, we have quinacridone magenta, and this is 100 plus years. So when this goes away, if it ever went away, you would see the underlying magenta that we put underneath it. Okay. So, But those are the two fugitive colors that we have. Permanent alizarin and opera pink. You you can't make a you can't make a um, fugitive color permanent. If you mix a hundred plus year um, color with a permanent, right? So this one's a hundred plus years, and this one's thirty years. You don't add the two up and say one hundred and thirty divided is it's seventy years. It doesn't work that way. You might make the fugitive one last another five years, another six years, but that's all that's going to happen. If you want to use permanent, then you need to use permanent. I'm going to show you how to read that in a second. That's a great question. Those are great questions. All right, you can go. Go forward. All right. 
So these are some of the quinacridones. Quinacridones are very beautiful. You probably all have used quinacridones at some point. We were the first ones to come out with the quinacridones in watercolor. Somebody else did an acrylic, but in watercolors, we were the first. They're, they're quite beautiful. They're fantastic for flowers as a pyro. Those are super beautiful. So these are some of the quinacridones. These are the pyrroles. So these are synthetic. These are the pyrroles. These are really bright, much brighter than you're seeing on your screen even. Um, it's kind of going to burn scarlet. We're not going to floral. This is a pyrrole, a pyrrole, a pyrrole, and a pyrrole. They're all very beautiful. They're synthetic. They're absolutely perfect. Gives that real brightness. If you want one that's probably maybe a step down in brightness, it'd be the perilines. The perilines are also very beautiful. Not as bright as the pyrroles, but, but beautiful. Um, so those are those are the quinacridones, the pyrroles, and the perilines. And before these are three environmental friendly colors that we make. Um, here in the U.S. in order to clean up streams. Um, there's a company that goes out, they'll clean streams up, they'll separate out the different oxides, and then we purchase it from them. It costs more than the same pigment I can buy synthetic. And what they use between the difference of that cost, of that price I'm charged, is they take that piece and they go and they clean up the next river or stream. So it's a, it's a phenomenal way to give back are these environmental friendly oxides. And we're really super proud of them. We've been using them for almost two decades. Beautiful. Some of your questions are what, I think I saw one, what makes something transparent? So color is always about the pigment. It's always about the pigment. Um, these are siennas. Ochres, umbers, a lot of uh, primatex were done by natives, people in the U.S. and other places where they would find ochres and siennas in riverbeds. They would crush them. They would put them into an animal fat, for example. They would wear them on their faces, put them on their ponies, put them on totem poles. And some of those are still around today. Um, so, and what makes it transparent? Some of the, for example, a an umber might be uh, 10 microns. So 10 microns, one tenth the thickness of a piece of paper, 10 microns. Transparent are less, are, are 0.1 micron, right? So they're 10 times smaller than just a micron. They're just unbelievably small. And that makes them transparent. You can see through them. I will show you what that looks like in a second. And that's a, a good thing to understand. Okay, so let's look at the color chart. If you have the color chart in front of you, it's a good thing to have it right now. Hey, Giovanni, I think I'm going to go probably um, at 11.15. We'll start doing uh, the paint outs. Okay? Okay. So right here is the legend. And this is going to talk about the symbology that we're going to look at down here. So it's good for you to have this. So you see the legend right here. And the information. I'm sorry, John. Just don't mean to interrupt you. I just want to make sure everybody's aware. Let me turn my camera on because um, you have it open. So I just want to make sure everybody's aware that, that it's this uh, in your sample kit. So right everyone there. should have. And so you should be able to follow along with yours right in front of you. Okay. Thank you, John. Yeah. So as Tara was saying, it's super important to have this when we're going to, when we're going to go over it or it will make no sense to you. And it's probably one of the best tools you could possibly have. Okay. So what, what we're going to go over here is um, the availability. We'll know by looking at this information, what this color is available in. 
We will know the light fastness, which is how long it will last in light, whether it stains or doesn't stain, whether it granulates or doesn't granulate, and its transparency, and also whether it's a Primatech or not a Primatech. So that's what we're going to be going over for this information. Okay, so let's look at buck titanium. So buck titanium is right here. It's right in the center corner, buck titanium. Okay, and in the top corner, Giovanni's showing his too. So it's right here, it's called buff titanium. Buff titanium. Okay. All right. So now let's go over what buff, buff titanium is saying here. The common name buff titanium. We see the pigment. The pigment is pigment white number six, colon one, which means shade one. Pigment white number six, PW6, colon one. It's available in 15 mil, five mil, stick. That's a stick format. Five mil, fifteen mil, and also in pen. All right. So then, the interesting thing is understanding about this color, and that's what we're looking at right here. So, when it says a one, that's for light fastness, and the light fastness for one is excellent for 100 plus years. The next thing is also a one, and that's for whether it stains or doesn't stain. And for example, this being a one means it's non-staining. The next is for whether it granulates or doesn't granulate. Titanium has a Y, which means it's granulating, and it's semi-transparent. So let me show you all of those. I, for example, I've always told, um, or here many times, um, I only need eight colors to paint. Or like my mom, I bought that color because it was a pretty color. And, and that's fine. Both those are fine things. But I will tell you, if one of your eight colors happens to be um, an opaque color, like chromium green oxide, and you use that, you need to be at the end of your story because once you use that, you're done. Right? Because as a watercolorist, you're always going from what? You're always going from light to dark. You're not like a oil colorist or an acrylic artist that can paint it like they see it. If I'm in oil colors, I could put light over dark, dark over light. It doesn't matter. If I'm a watercolorist, I'm always looking at my subject. I'm tearing it apart. And then I'm painting it from light to dark. So if I'm looking at Marguerite, who happens to be on my top screen there, Marguerite has white hair and her brim, her rim of her glasses are black. I'm not going to start with black because that's at the end of my story. I'm going to start with the different shades from the lightest to the darkest. And that's why knowing about what colors you're using is super important. If I use three transparents, I'm at the end of my story. If I'm at using five transparents, I'm pretty much at the end of my story. If I'm using three transparents, I'm at the end of my story. If I'm using one opaque, I'm at the end of my story. And that's what this is telling you. It gives you the power over a cup of coffee to make a lot of decisions. Just like you make a decision on what brush you're going to use and what paper you're going to use, you need to be making the same decisions over the paint you're going to use. And you can do that over a cup of coffee by using this chart. So when I talk about the buff titanium, I talk about things, for example, that it doesn't stain. So here's an example of staining. Here's cobalt violet. It's non-staining, which means I can take a wet brush and I can lift that color right off. That's non-staining. If it's low staining, I can still take it off, but I see a very, very slight U. If it's medium staining, I can see a lot more. And finally, if it's high staining, it really, for the most part, doesn't move. 
So those are things this color chart is telling you. Now let's look at another one that's important, and that is transparency. This side is black and this side is white. If I look at quinacridone burnt orange, the reason it looks black, it's transparent. I'm seeing the black underneath, I'm seeing this black color underneath because it's transparent. Semi-transparent, I see a little bit more red. You can kind of see it there, see it way more in front of me. And that's because that's semi-transparent. And then if it's opaque, I see a huge amount of green because I can't see the black anymore, right? So that's what you're seeing. And then if it's granulating, and this is really any type of granulation from the very smallest amount, almost imperceivable, to the heaviest, we would tell you that it's granulating. The reason that we tell you it's granulating, even if it's very, very mild, is when you put a granulating color to a non-granulating color, you're going to put some of the characteristics of that granulation into your non-granulating color. So if you were a realist painter and you were doing a Ferrari and you wanted no granulation because they would call that a recall in our car industry, then you'd want to choose all colors that were non-granulating. So it starts giving you real power over what you want to do. So let's do one together. And if you don't um, quite understand this, it's a great time to ask a question. So let's do right under the Daniel Smith symbol right here, you'll see quinethalone yellow. Quinethalone yellow. So this is a single pigment. It's P for pigment. It's Y for yellow, number 138. So pigment yellow, 138. It's called quinethalones because what the, chemi chemi the pigment manufacturer called it. It's available in 15 mil. How long will it last? What number are you seeing for light fastness? If you can put your fingers up, which finger? So what, what is the light fastness of this color? How many fingers? Two. Thank you, Liz. Yeah, it's a two. And a two means 100 years. So we've tested this in the xenon phenometer out to 100 years before we saw any noticeable um, effect on this color. So the next one is a two. So what does that mean? Is this one um, staining, non-staining, light staining? What do you think? Would I see a, a tint on this color? Yeah, I'd see a, I would see a slight tint for this color because it's a two low staining, okay? And then does it granulate? So if you shake your head yes or no, does it granulate? No, thank you, Liz. And last thing, it's semi-transparent. This big number up here is just the series. This one is a series three, and that just kind of gives the, it's, it's for what the pricing is. A one is the, the least expensive and a four is the most expensive. Most of that comes down to one, how costly the pigment is and or how costly the pigment is and how long it takes to manufacture it. I try to push as many into ones as possible. More than half of them are ones um, or twos and another, another three quarters are twos. Um, okay, so let me ask you, I was in the Philippines and this is one that would help you you as an artist as well. I was in the Philippines and the presenter had just done a beautiful wash in green. And in this particular color, she wanted to pick up a certain amount of it to put another color in the void she just created. What characteristic would she be thinking of? So would she be thinking of staining or would she be thinking of light fastness? What is she thinking of? She's thinking of staining because she wants to lift the color up. She's trying to pick a green that's going to be non-staining so she can pick that color up. Okay, say we have the same artist and now she wants to do three layers or four layers. What's the characteristic in the paint she's going to choose that's going to be important to her? Is it light fastness? Is it staining? Is it granulation or is it transparency? Just hold your fingers up as one, two, three, or four. 
What do you think is going to be the most important thing for her? Michael, which finger are you holding up? One? So the most important thing would be four. If she wants to do layering, then she wants the most transparent colors to do the most layers possible. You're going to do way more layers with a transparent color, slightly less with a semi-transparent and opaque. You have to be done your story. That's kind of how you use your color chart over a cup of coffee. It really puts you in the ability to pick the best tool possible for what you want to accomplish. I would say if you don't understand that, come to the Thursday session and ask or send me an email and ask. It's probably one of the best things for you to know. It really gives you as an artist, whether you end up using it or not, it gives you huge power over the color, which is always best. This right here just shows the general colors. These are our general colors. We have 266 colors. These right here are the Primatech colors. These are the Primatech, which I'm gonna show you right here in a second. And these are the luminescent. The luminescent have mica. They have different aspects depending on the viewer's uh, point of view. The luminescents are pearlescent, iridescent, interference, and duochrome. Okay. They work differently over light surfaces than they do over dark surfaces. So let me show you the Privatex. So while I'm doing this, if you have questions, please go ahead and ask questions. Hey, John, I have a couple from earlier that I saved. Apologies if uh, you've answered these in the, in the meantime. I don't think so, though. Um, why doesn't Daniel Smith make larger than 15 mil tubes? Um. So we sell product all over the world. And in Europe, the spaces are, are much smaller than they are in the US. And to have uh, eight racks would really be, there, there's probably very few people that would have eight different racks of, of, of product. And then with 266 colors, it would be which ones would we come out with the larger tubes? Um, and there wouldn't necessarily be a huge savings, any savings with a bigger tube versus a 15 mil tube. Awesome. All right. And then uh, someone said that their one of their favorite Daniel Smith paints is Cote d'Azur Violet, but it's discontinued. Any chance you might recreate some of those that have been discontinued? Yeah, you know, we don't um, we don't discontinue paint. What happens to the manufacturer of the pigment stops? For example, um, probably as most all of you know, quinacridone gold, I bought the entire world supply about 17 years ago because they had stopped the production of it. And we finally ran out about uh, 17 years after I bought it. Um, and the one that we just heard of is quinacridone burnt orange, for example, a very popular quinacridone is no longer made. We bought uh, 17 years worth of the pigment but that pigment is no longer made. And the quinacridones, they won't allow anybody else because it's a patent process. They will not allow anybody else to use that patent. So once the manufacturer um, says they're not gonna make it, it's pretty much, for the most part, um, the end of the story. That's sad. <laughs> yeah, but it makes yeah, sense. But... You know, really, it's sad, but it's really, it's us as consumers. For example, if you're old enough, remember back um, 15 years ago when a, a huge amount of the Toyotas were gold, that was quinacridone gold. And that, that wow. fell out of love from us. We no longer like to buy that color car. So the manufacturers said, okay, we're not going to buy that pigment anymore. And there went the, the industry for that mm -hmm. color. Like so that. I get it. You know, we are we change our what we like and what we don't like. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, do the sticks have as much saturation of color as the two paints, and what binds them together into stick form? So all the sticks, the pans, the five mil, the fifteen mil, all have the same binder, which is gum arabic. They all have the same pigment. The sticks have substantially 
um, higher pigment load. And they have to have that because it's the only way I get to have them stick together. Uh, so they're a, they're, they're certainly, a, I didn't make them to be a phenomenal deal. They are a phenomenal deal. Um, they're essentially roughly five half pans and one stick. Um, I bought them as Giovanni will show. Giovanni loves to use the sticks to do his beautiful artwork. He'll show that here in a minute. Um, so it's the same binder. It's the same pigment, just a lot more. Um, the pans, for example, have about 10% water. The sticks have about 12% uh, water, maybe 13. And the um, tubes have about 17% water. So the, the, the pans, when we make the pans and sell the pans, um, they are by far the most concentrated. Uh, the most uh, volume of pigment is going to be the sticks, for sure. So Giovanni will show both of those. Good question. So right here, I have tourmaline. Tourmaline is a mineral black. It's a beautiful mineral. It's a beautiful mineral black. And then this right here is tiger's eye. And this is tiger's eye. And this is serpentine from Australia. This is Pipestone. Pipestone is from Minnesota. It's called Pipestone because they used to make peace pipes out of it. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. This is rhodonite. It's one of the most expensive minerals that we have is rhodonite. Um, bloodstone, I'll, here I'll show it to you. I have to wear a glove when I touch. Ah, I gotta use a glove to touch it because it's just huge. If I touch it, my hands will turn red. So that is bloodstone. It's a Primatech. And that's what bloodstone looks like. So that's all natural granulation. This is red jasper, it's from India. Red jasper. Hematite, a hematite a little while ago, this is from Idaho. People ask me, well, John, some of the Primatex uh, must have glitter. And it's like, no, some of them have natural mica. So this is right here, red fuchsite, and red fuchsite has natural mica. And this is green fuchsite. Huge amounts of natural mica. And another one, this has no mica, but this just because of the crystal, this is called kyanite. This one is called Sugilite. So it's, it's purplish. This one is zoocyte. So zoot ha zoocyte has these huge rubies. So that's zoocyte. This one is sodalite. Beautiful granulation. Hey, John. Um, yeah. Sharon's uh, question seems appropriate for right now. Could you please explain granulation? How does it translate to final look? So granulation again is again, um, you'll get that very much so in um, the Primatex. It's this is natural granulation, and this will come across to your your work as well. Um, we have many examples of it um, online. 
For example, if I was doing rusted farm equipment, I might use an iron oxide or a hematite, et cetera, because it is actually rust. Um, so it's going to look exactly like that. If I was doing a door, for example, uh, I might use a green appetite to do a piece of a door. I might use the green appetite. So it depends on, it's just a, it's just another aspect of the watercolors. Just a great deal of artists using them. Um, Thomas Schuller uses them. Um, Giovanni uses them. Um, probably we have uh, close to 50 or 57 uh, brand ambassadors that use um, brand knitting uh, Primatex. <coughs> so it's just another aspect. If you're a if you're a realist painter, it's something you may never use. <laughs> if you want to experiment, it's something that um, you may want to try because it just it's very interesting in, in what it can do. Giovanna, do you have any granulating artwork? Not sure. We know about that. Um, a good way to, to answer that question, whoever might have asked that, on Friday, I have artists um, uh, presentation, and it's artists from all over the world, and many times they're using um, granite and colors, and you can actually watch them in their process of doing paints, or you can come in on Thursday, today, for example, and ask that question, and one of the brand ambassadors would actually probably have artwork, or or you could see it real time. So be good, a good way to do it would be to come in. Thursday or Friday. Okay, so that's, uh, we have 36 of the Primatex. I'm going to show them to you. Um, this is the red fuchsia, the one that did this. This is Amazonite. Just this. Sodalite, you've seen. Hematite, we have several different hematites. Heme just means blood, so it's an iron. Um, burnt tiger's eye, we take the tiger's eye. We put it into an oven, and it changes it to this format. So it just causes oxidation, and then we'll process that into pigment and make paint out of it. The lapis, so lapis is a baby blue. The fuchsia you saw, that was the green one. Sedona, if you're from Arizona, um, Sedona is Red Rock country. So that is that is from Sedona. Uh, mummy bauxite. Let me see some other ones you might like. Yavapai. Yavapai is from Yavapai County. This is from the Grand Canyon. So I buy this from the Grand Canyon. Um, Mayan blue genuine is the only Mayan blue genuine is the only one that is not a mineral. Um, it is indigo infused into um, clay and then processed. It's the same format that the Mayans use. So that's why we call it the genuine. It's the same exact process. We have other Mayan colors, but they were not used by the Mayans. This was absolutely used by the Mayans. Same exact process. Um, so if you wanted, for example, to use something that this would be really interesting, but it's not a mineral. It's a, uh, it's indigo infused into clay. And then Kingman, we have Kingman and Sleeping Beauty. Huh. These are both turquoise. It's because it's the Sleeping Beauty mine located in Arizona. And this is from the Kingman mine located in Arizona. That's where those names come from. People ask me that all the time. This might be your birthstone. This is amethyst. Okay, so with that, I think I'd like to spend either um, certainly time answering your questions, but as you can see, Giovanni is doing paint outs, and I think you can answer quite a few of your questions from a painting standpoint. And then if you have more questions as you think about them, um, Tara can relay them back to me, and I'd be glad to answer them. So Tara, can we put uh, Giovanni on the main screen? Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Absolutely. I will remove your spotlight.
Okay. Is that good? Okay, it's good. Thank you to all. And now I try to prepare my little demo very, very fast. Nice to meet you to all and, and try to my best to create the, my paint demo with a watercolor and same with the gouache. This is the reference photos. It's very, very easy, but it's very fast for me. Usually I paint this in one week, but in 40 minutes it's very, very fast. <laughs> okay. Now I, I have prepared the, the two options and uh, apply them. Uh, the, this is a um, first application of the uh, lamb black of gouache. And uh, now I apply the lamb black of watercolor. I prepare. This is the, the color, same color, the gouache and watercolor for use for this paint. Okay. I prepare one black. Usually in, in this paint, uh, I prepare the, before the black background, the little grisale, then the high percent color in the photo reference is blue and green and uh, prepare before the um, little grisale, but now, I application directly the lamb black for check the difference uh, watercolor and wash. Lamb black is um, one of my favorite black because it's very very opaque. Now I prepared the, the, the sheet with the masking tape with a few parts of glue and cutting with my knife. As in this case, use in this way, not in this way, but outside. Usually painting my black background in my painting, I use not a brush, but a sea sponge because I like the, I, I don't like the flat black, but with the sea sponge, have a little movement in the shape, in the dark. This, I use this sponge for, apply my black and apply in, in, in a full imperial size, 50 layer of black. After three or two layer, the resale. I use this a little part of water and the gouache, a little, little part of water. This is a mass stone of lamb black. In this case, I use the this brush, Princeton Aquelet, is very good brush. Synthetic Koliski. Okay. And for example, By 
more long blade too. I show my my techniques before the black burn ground. I deal with it with more water. Now I, I apply, for example, the lavender and permanent green light. I'm mixing. So, little zone of the greasy leaf. I create a little tone of <coughs> green gray. Giovanni, what paper are you using? What? Sorry. What, what paper are you using? Oh, a brand artistical. It's extra white, 300 grams. Thank you. It should be the same paper that's included in your sample kit. Artistico, I'm not sure if you got extra white or the regular white though, but it is Fabriano Artistico and this, the weight, 140 pound. I use only the extra white because in, in hyper-realistic style, the, the color is, for the color is important. Okay. My start. I apply the little grizzle. It's a simple sea sponge, full sea sponge. In my painting, I prefer this mode because I have more movement in the dark. After this, I starting to apply the first layer of lamb black in this case only the water color but to check the difference I got a little zoom. The wash is completely opaque. And the watercolor now, when I dry, is opaque, but it's different. It's lamb black. It's the same binder, same pigment, but the wash is very silky and very velvet. It's beautiful, beautiful color. When I finished this part, covering the white hole and apply, apply, apply the layer when I arrive, got to arrive. And this. And after remove, okay. Now I start in painting the watercolor and wash in the same color. Okay. My I decide to use the ultramarine blue wash, spring green wash, and watercolor, and titanium white for the first layer. Apply in my palette, sorry. 
my ceramic palette. Spring green in wash. Spring green in watercolor. Ultramarine in wash. Watercolor. titanium light for the saturation in front of me uh, I have a reference photo but, and have the original bottle or check in the rear and the photo or check the light and the, the color Okay, now I'm starting. In wash, mixing the green and blue for create little dark green similar to aquamarine green and apply a little point of white for desaturation and apply I use a more water as the, but the wash is very beautiful in mass tone. Okay, the same in watercolor. Change the quantity. Every monitor probably check the color different. But in, in real, the gouache is very, very opaque. Now I use the, the, the brush number 10 with a perfect point. I change my brush. I use different, two different brush for one for wash and one for watercolor. More water marine blue for dark. The wash. And I, re I remember when I painting wash painting in a, in positive mode because of the the white I use the uh, the color but in watercolor usually painting negative because the the white is a paper I use the paper but the most important watercolor the titanium white and the Chinese white for desaturation the color. Okay. Change and in watercolor. I 
very, very fast. <coughs> now I apply plus. More white in wash, more green. Apply the lavender in wash for create the little gray tone in green. And the lavender in watercolor. I created a little gray tone inside the green. This is a spring green, ultramarine blue, and titanium white and lavender. Mm -hmm. I create a in wash is different because the is very, very opaque, but in watercolor is the transparency is important. I use in this case more blue and more spring green, more darky and lavender. I change the quantity of color for checking the difference. And back in wash, apply more lavender, more white. And now I use the cobalt blue for when I'm waiting for drying this part. This is watercolor. Blue wash. For the first layer of the other bottle. On white and green. Oops, sorry. This is our first layer before the the blue tone. This is a process, obviously. It's a long process for me to obtain the results.
this is the, the first layer. Sorry for my, my voice and my English. Is the first layer of green before the blue tone in gouache. And now apply in watercolor. Green and apply a watercolor. It's a similar process to black background, it's a little greasy of green before the blue tone and apply on the, when I check the photo reference in a part of the, have a green shade. <coughs> now in this case, I, I use only this brush, but for the, the this line, I use six zero five zero brushes. Quando i due sono confusi in grandi diversi, anche a creare le gouache, e se lo portate bene, perfetto sempre. No, 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 not only for this demo, I changed the brush because I uh, mm, same binder and same pigment, but I prefer for the different cleaning after the, my, my demo, my, my studio, my working is a different me. I use in my, in my studio, one brush for watercolor, one brush for gouache, for oil, for acrylics. I use the different brush. Now I apply the blue tone in watercolor. <coughs> And apply in all the surface. This is it. Thank you. I created the blue tone. Is it similar real process? Real bottle, sorry. But apply many, many layers for this to create this tone. And in wash is different because it's very opaque. But use more water and more white. Create similar to lavender.
non ho capito che cosa significa la gente saggia con, con, con il Gesù. Non vedo come la gente saggia, pensando che vorresti dire il Gesù. No, no, the, the Grisel is, is a basic, this, this is a, only the process, because I created the Grisel only for explain. I use, in this case, I use the green or create the, the green shade before the blue. I use more blue. <clears throat> and on the gouache. Photo. I check my photograph. Yes, I have the same opacity. Okay, change to watercolor. <coughs> First blue tone. Yes. I I Painting every my painting have a, in the black black before black background have a greasy. Nelle marche di gouache c'è un gessoso a gouache. Nella caramita come gessoso. It's very very silky. The Daniel Smith gouache is very very silky. It's beautiful. This is the real essence of gouache. Okay, when I'm waiting the drying, I create the this surface with buff titanium in washing watercolor. So with titanium white inside, more titanium white inside. Because I, I have, for example, now I use in the gouache a little part of water. Is gouache. Two, three drops of water, not too much.
very fast. Not, not applying in this part of the shadow, bottom shadow. <clears throat> and watercolor in watercolor I use more 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 water This is a watercolor. Check the difference with stone and watercolor, but it's very, very opaque. In the monitor, I, I don't know, but in the real, it's very, very opaque. After mm, applying many, many layers, the result is this. One bottle in uh, watercolor and one bottle in gouache. Which one? <laughs> this is a gouache and this is a watercolor in the same color. More strong and little strong. This is a buff titanium in watercolor and th this is lamb black in watercolor. <laughs> On canvas, no, the gouache, no. But I, I apply the, the gouache uh, on wood and show my last painting on board. This is gouache, only the gouache. I check the, the texture. Gouache is lamb black, lavender, cobalt blue, ultramarine, titanium white and lamb black. This is on board. Okay, I come back. Thank you. Come back, John. Thank you, Giovanni. That was excellent. I Thank wanted you. to um, answer some questions that were asked. So, the uh, gouache is the same pigment that we use in our watercolor. So, the watercolor is a watercolor. We call the gouache a water media. And that's because the gouache is opaque. Um, they're all opaque. Even the transparents that we use, we make them opaque. Um, there is no white added. It's just the way that you can make a gouache, it costs more, of course. It's the way that we do it. We just add more pigment to cover up the white, which makes it also quite matte. And I'll give you some examples. Um, here, what we have uh, is the way that Giovanni was using it much of the time, which is mass toned. This is right out of the tube, okay? This is one-to-one, -one, one part paint to one part water. And what we're showing you here is the heaviness of the amount of pigment. And the, the way that we show you that how much pigment is added is we um, mix it with titanium white and it just shows you the heavy pigment load. So this is what it is out of the tube. There is no white in it. It's just pure pigment. The neat thing about the gouache is you can see, if you want to, you can see the brush strokes. So it's almost like using an oil or an acrylic because you can see the brush strokes if you want to do that. Um, this is cobalt teal blue. And this is kind of interesting. This is uh, 
This is iridescent gold in a gouache. And this might answer the question more. This right here is watercolor moon glow. This is watercolor moon glow. And this is gouache moon glow. And you can see the difference. The pigment load is just off the off the chart when it comes to the gouache. And in mass tone, it's just it's quite gorgeous in mass tone. Um, so kind of different animals, watercolor media, watercolor, both the same binder, both the same pigment, just a huge amount of pigment in this process. Show you again, this is opera pink in watercolor. This is gouache aqua, opera pink. You can see the, the difference between the two. And this is it mixed with titanium white to show you just how, just how heavy the pigment load is. And then there's, we're looking at a lot of new colors, another 22, but to make the 22, we had to test 44 more new ones. Um, so this is iridescent gold, iridescent copper in gouache. And we just came out with, um, I took it from the, from the laboratory, we just came out with uh, thalo turquoise, which is a really awesome color in the gouache. So there are there are transparent pigments in the gouache, but the gouache is going to make them opaque. And so the whole line is opaque. Okay. Do you have any questions about the gouache? I saw some. I think that answered most of them. Um, John, there's a real there's a, <clears throat> a great question about. Uh, it says, Giovanni, do you prime the board before working on it with gouache? Can you paint on canvas with gouache? Do you need to apply a primer, a medium beforehand? If so, which one? It's, it's you know, Giovanni can answer that, but it's, it's really going to depend on on how you're painting, right? If you're gonna if you're gonna use a watercolor later on, you're gonna want to have a a, um, a size watercolor paper. If you're just using the gouache and the gouache alone as mass tone, um, that would highly negate that. But you know, once you start going down the path and you're, you're going to use something that's non non um, sized because you're using mass tone for gouache, and they say, "Oh, I want to add some water to well," then that that would have required it to be sized. So safest way is always to use the sized paper, even if you're using the gouache. That way you have flexibility down the road if you want to do any type of changes whatsoever. Can you paint on canvas? Do you need to apply a primary medium beforehand? Um, yeah, but the, 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 the wood, uh, for example, I apply the um, watercolor gesso for, uh, before the, uh, yeah. the gouache. So there's things you can use, as Giovanni was saying. There's, it's it's non watercolor, um, a gesso, um, but if you're staying within the watercolor world, even though the gouache is a water media, it's always super safe to use sized paper. Um, you could use the uh, watercolor ground as yeah. well, um, etc. So lots of versatility, and that's the thing about the watercolor chart. Um, the way that we always look at the world is how to give the artist the most versatility. John, is, is there ever an issue with gouache cracking if the surface is too flexible? You know, so it, it depends on how many layers you put down. So this, you know, I, I can't get it to crack. If you put three or four layers, it depends on how big your layers were, uh, that's possible. Okay, that's great. Um, and the same I, thing would happen, for example, with acrylic or with oil. I mean, depending on how much you're putting down, right? Well, I mean, it, you tell me. So, so my um, or us, <laughs> uh, you know, the what I've always and this could be absolutely wrong, but what I've always known about gouache is that if your surface is super flat, like use a a 
board backed paper or a minimum 140 pound paper simply because if you put your gouache on then um you know it could crack if your paper is too flexible or if you're putting it onto a surface that it doesn't adhere to so that's but if that's an incorrect well i would say i don't i wouldn't say incorrect i would say there's way less possibility of that depending on how much um gouache you put down if you put a really heavy load i mean a really heavy load that's absolutely possible okay but if you put just you know a kind of whatever regular means um then just like this right here this is 140 but i could put it on just regular paper and and do that as well if i put a really heavy load well then you know it's it's that's a possible because you're making it you're making it very stiff the more you put on you're making it very stiff and anything you make stiff if you try to bend it over that's a possibility yeah, but I, I don't. But like you're saying, like you know, it, I don't think it's that big of a concern. I would think it's, it'd be it. Not, it wouldn't be the methodology by which most of the artists watching would ever even begin to paint. I agree absolutely. with you. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Um, um, so I, what I liked was that uh, Kathleen asked that you know Giovanni gives the characteristics of gouaches, velvet, opaque, and silky. What would the character like? What would be the ca similar characteristics for watercolor? So, you know, they're, 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 they're apples and oranges, even though they're the same pigment, even though they're the same binder, they're, they're very much different because when you're thinking about the gouache, um, you're thinking about wanting, originally they were made for opaque because of doing photography, right? You didn't want the flash. You didn't want that on it. So that's why they were originally developed. Um, they're great for highlighting. They're great for doing uh, paintings that have just a different, a different way of looking than just typical watercolor. Um, the watercolor is, you you use the watercolor as watercolorists for all the nuances they have. You do the, you use the transparent because there's something that you want to convey that that allows you to convey it. You use the semi-transparent in a different way. You use the opaque in a different way. You use the granulating colors in a different way. So whereas the gouache, gouache are very beautiful and they have at least two common characteristics, they're very opaque and they're very matte. You look at the watercolor on the other side for all the various amounts of qualities that they have that allow you to complete your vision. So they're really apples and oranges when you think about it. There is no one consistent watercolor. I mean, a watercolor can be, one can be granulating, um, uh, opaque. Another one can be staining, transparent, and, and not granulating. Those, those characteristics can change from pigment to pigment, which just give you, I believe, the most, just a huge amount of versatility. That's why it's so beautiful for you to learn the, the, the watercolor chart. It allows you as an artist who can already picture things to use that as a tool to really accomplish what you want to accomplish. It's a great tool for you. Oh, that's somebody. a good point. Sharon mentioned that Matisse used gouache for his cutouts. So that's a good visual. Yeah, I see a lot of artists use gouache to do, um, to draw attention to different areas, um, which is pretty fabulous. And again, I'm, I invite all of you to Thursday and Friday. You can find it on um, the danismith.com site and it's free. And you can ask the artist the question. You can watch artists from all over the world different do different techniques. Um, there was uh, an artist from uh, San Diego, and I, hers was just fantastic because she used the most staining colors that there are. All of her whole dot card is nothing but staining colors. And, and she loves the strength of that and how she can uh, play with those. It's just different. It's just great to hear different perspectives. And I think that's why we like, you know, groups like this or we like our watercolor societies just to hear different perspectives and different ways of thinking. I think we can handle that one last question. Uh, as you surface, as you squash to make their designs appear. Yeah. 
Well, there was, can you augment your watercolor painting with gouache, which is what I think you just. Alluded. Yeah, they're actually, they're absolutely, um, because it's the same pigment, it's the same binder. Will they work together? Yes, you can mix them. Just know that when you mix a, a, a our gouache, I'm sorry about our brand, our gouache with the watercolor, the, the gouache is going to have many, just a huge amount more pigment load than the watercolor. So it's kind of like that. Um, uh, granulating versus non-granulating. Just know that when you're going to play with with different aspects of colors, what they're going to bring to the table for you. But yes, by all means, I think one of the beautiful things about being a watercolorist is just trying different things, trying different techniques, and mm -hmm. and just seeing what works for you. I mean, that's kind of like the the neat voyage, just trying different things. Absolutely. Well, we really appreciate you guys for being here today. And I learned so much and I can tell that everybody else did as well. Um, so we we sincerely appreciate it. John, Giovanni, Scott, so much. And all of our You're friends, great. thank you so much for, for being Absolutely. here as well. I, you guys were there strong through the entire thing. And I could tell how engaged you, you all were. So if you were inspired to make anything today, please use the hashtag create with Plaza art when you post it so we can see, and we will see you all again soon. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Great thank to see you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.